Um, and then early labor, so first days, we're performing a temperature assessment every four hours, so you should at least get a full set of vital, vital signs, especially in early on in labor, if they're not on any medications, every four hours, or at least every hour. Um, so during the active phase, you want to provide the client, um, and we're going to look over the client and fetal monitoring, so again, we want to make sure that the fetal well-being is good, let's see, you know, is baby having axels, um, whatever deceleration what are we doing. Um, encourage for position changes. So sometimes if baby is just in a wonky position, that's baby just, uh, her cervix may not be smooth and yanked because we can't get that uh, baby to um, be engaged in, into the pelvis. So we have to do constant position changes. So we can have them walk, they can go on the yoga ball, typing breaths, um, encourage relaxation. Um, we can grow to 10 centimeters, completely dilated, okay? That's gonna be first stage of labor. Our second stage is gonna be complete dilation of cervix until delivery of baby. So at this point, we want the, the overwhelming urge to push, but we're good because she's fully dilated and we can start pushing with her. And then here's just kind of a picture of um, the cardinal movements of labor. So kind of how um, baby gets engaged and all the way into expulsion here. We can look over that. Um, at that point, if the um, placenta, for, if the provider is waiting for the placenta to get delivered, so that's going to be your third stage of labor, um, they can assess for any kind of perineal lacerations while we're waiting for the, um, the placenta to be delivered. So um, we will look to see if maybe they have a first, second, third degree, or fourth degree laceration. Mm -hmm. So here's a picture of that. Do you mind turning that light down just real quick? I think it's a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Um, so the top goes from first, second, third, and then fourth degree. So we have our first degree tear here. So this is endogenous skin and subcutaneous. Um, to continue to monitor the client and the fetus. So um, once we're ready for delivery, you will have, um, well as a nurse, you should always go in and check your warmer. So make sure your warmer is working. Um, make sure the oxygen and suction is on. Um, and then usually the charge nurse, if they have a designated baby nurse, will be in there to take care of baby while you're still taking care of the client. So um, you wanna check the oxygen flow and turn on the warmer. We wanna preheat the radiant warmer. So if we have to take baby to the warmer, we can take baby um, there. Um, we'll have a, the newborn stethoscope and a bulb syringe ready, have um, resuscitation equipment. Um, usually just have some contraction and baby keeps dropping down to like the 40s then we may need to take a break from pushing or kind of see where the uh, baby station is or we may have to do some other maneuvers or use other equipment like a vacuum or um, forceps to, for delivery. So we need to make sure baby is doing okay during those pushing efforts. Um, pushing can take on from minutes on up to three hours of pushing. So usually we won't call the provider unless baby's not looking so great or something's going on with mom. Um, but usually we'll just call the provider once the head is like out by that much. So um, the providers will come in and deliver once there are, once patients can just give them a couple pushes, they're not in there the whole time. Um, we want to promote rest between those contractions. So usually we just tell them to take 10 days rest. Sometimes we may have to give them a little bit of oxygen. Um, we can use a fan. So we're still gonna monitor blood pressure, pulse, respiration, measurements every 15 minutes. Um, at least an hour of sleeping and not having to worry about her baby, you know, being hungry or crying. But so. if she refuses, she Which, can just stay. Yeah, they can stay. So we, we just offer. So there shouldn't be any reason unless medically indicated we're taking that baby out of the room. Ms. I have a question. We have our fourth stage. So this is the delivery of placenta until the stabilization of mother. So after um, the placenta has been delivered, we will do our fundal checks. So we'll discuss everything about postpartum next week. Um, we'll check their fundus, check their uh, vital signs every 15 minutes, make sure their bleeding is um, good. We'll continue to watch baby, um, take vitals on baby, um, and then we usually just keep them for two hours um, and just make sure they're stable enough, and then they can move on to the postpartum unit um, for the rest of their hospital. So if mom wants to have a little bit of a break or get her to eat something, um, promote um, the first lap, so we try and get baby laps on in the first couple hours. So sometimes babies may be in a sleeping period the first 24 hours, they may not be too interested, so we just have to let them know to keep waking baby up as much as we can to feed them. The 
kind of went through that. So um, we're going to uh, the vital signs for that fundus is nice and firm, and making sure if we're expelling clots or anything like that, we want to continue the massage. So sometimes we really have to get in there, um, and they're usually pretty sore the next day. So we usually just labor and delivery nurses are really mean when it comes to the fundal massages. When they go to postpartum, they just make sure, oh yeah, I feel it, good. Um, doing our fundal massages, you have to know what you're bleeding. So kind of take a look at what their pad looks like before you can um, do your massage and then kind of see, you know, what's left. So if there's more or just kind of see how much. I'd like to fill that the fundus. It should fill massages uh, for our C-section um, patients. So um, they'll have their um, dressing. Um, so what you'll do is you'll just kind of put your hand on that dressing and then you're going to put some pressure on their fundus. Um, just to kind of help with, because you don't want to open those sutures. So you still may have to do a little, it just depends on how much bleeding is going on, because they can still bleed a lot after a C-section. So just until, you know, you know that, you know, if they're bleeding a scant or if it's light or if it's moderate, whatever, it will depend on how hard you push it. But usually with a C-section, um, as long as you're, you're filling the fundus nice and firm, they're not having a lot of bleeding, then you don't have to push so hard. But always put pressure on that dressing. And it hurts them more than the other ones, right? Like yeah, it'll, it'll more be more incision pain. So usually like the first couple, because they still have that medication that's final, usually should last usually like a couple hours, hopefully. Um, if not, you can always give them more pain or care for a laboring client at 38 East gestation. The reporting nurse communicates the most recent vaginal exam is six centimeters dilated. Minus one is not engaged into pelvic until they're at zero station. So yes, they're in active labor, but it's not fully engaged in the pelvis at minus one station. Now, if it says plus one, then they'd be fully engaged. Yes, second stage, we're ready to deliver baby. Okay, so we'll go through this and I'll give you guys a break after we go through all of this. Um, therapy, none of that. Even if it moved, if nope. it had moved out of the way, they still won't? Nope. It's too high risk. So with the cephalic version, uh, what we do is um, once they get to the hospital, um, we get them all set up, we get IV started, um, we get fluids running. Usually we can set them up with an epidural um, to get them comfortable just because it's very painful uh, when they do this and it poses risks to not only mom but also baby. Um, so when we're doing this, the risk is well for baby, it could uh, cause a, a uterine rupture. So if we're taking them back for a C-section, um, or if it's not um, successful, we'll take them back for a C-section. Is that another reason why they wait till 37, 38 weeks? It's, it's within the safe stage? Yeah. Yeah. It's the safer so stage to deliver baby at that point. Mm -hmm. um, they just try not to do it later on, and that's going to be provider preference. Oh. So usually I would recommend to a patient not to do it after 37 weeks. Definitely not. But so that's not my it. place to... Uh, whatever they have discussion they have with the doctor, that's their discussion. You can't do anything to change your mind. We're in that lateral position, so sitting sideways, then it's a little bit easier. We can try definitely, but if they've been breached the whole time, they were gonna do that to me. And when I went in, her patient, so more they've had more than one baby, um, is good. That means their cervix is they're probably be able to have a successful vaginal delivery, hopefully, um, with their cervix. Um, and then anything, a bishop score greater than 10 in a first time pregnancy, um, the patient indicates readiness for labor. So just remember, I wish my bishop score was high enough to induce. Um, so it needs to be a high number in order to be considered induced, especially if it's like an elective induction. So our elective inductions, there's no medical reasoning for them to be induced, it's just that the mom is tired of being pregnant and wants to go ahead and have a baby. So usually they're, um, if more than one pregnancy, they can be induced at 39 weeks. Usually dilation, cervical patient, cervical consistency, and a cervical position. So um, we, the doctors are gonna score those um, four areas. And then based on that score, we'll let us know if you know, they're gonna be a good patient to induce. Um, again, those that are medically getting induced, we don't have to do a bishop score. The bishop score is gonna be more towards the ones that do elective inductions. So we have to know um, how to score. So when the score is high, uh, we can just 
help them get sleep? Yeah, so they can be induced, so we can give them some oxytocin, we can do a little, we can do up to nine weeks, and the score should be eight or higher for the bishop in order to induce them. Electively. Okay, so now we have our patient. She's um, getting induced for whatever reason. So we have um, different kind of medications and devices that we can use uh, to get the patient to dilate. So, um, we have our cervical ripening, so um, with our medications here, it promotes cervical softening, dilation, and effacement. Um, adverse effects to prostaglandins that we'll go over is tachycystole. Do you remember what tachycystole is? Uh, the contractions? So, a lot of contractions, so more than five contractions in a, how many minutes? Two. 10 minute period. So anything more than five contractions in a 10 minute period is considered tachycystole. They're contracting too much. So when we do the cervical wipe for, uh, ripening, we need to be cautious on when we are gonna give them another dose of this medication. So at press is mesoprostol. So this is the prostaglandin E1. Um, it's a little pill. We also use mesoprostol at a higher dose when it comes to postpartum hemorrhages. Definitely insert it or they can um, take it orally. But usually we want to insert it vaginally. Um, it kind of helps it um, a little, the cervix out a little bit better than it does orally. So that should um, promote that softening, the dilation, and effacement. So once we give them that mesoprostol, we monitor them for four hours and we see what their contractions are doing. Um, at that point, after four hours, we'll check their cervix. Say we started them, they were closed, and now um, their cervix is one centimeter dilated. If she's not contracting too much and baby's doing okay, then we're gonna go ahead and do another dose four hours later of mesoprostol. Okay, so this is what we call a cervical balloon catheter. Um, so after, if, um, once their cervix is at least one centimeter and that cervix is forward, um, we can, the provider can place the cervical balloon catheter. So, um, they insert this balloon catheter, so it's deflated once you um, put some oxytocin, once they have this in too, if they're not contracting as much, to just get those contractions um, a little bit stronger for their cervix to dilate. Um, so this is that cervical dilation balloon. <coughs> um, turn the lights back on. Um, sometimes, as long as the patient is going for the prenatals, and uh, I don't know if you guys heard, like stripping their membrane, so basically stripping uh, their membranes away from um, the uterine wall. We kind of went into this. Um, so it's a deliberate initiation of uterine contractions to stimulate labor before the spontaneous onset. Augmentation of labor is a stimulation of hypotonic contractions. Once the 